if you could get beef, chicken, or pork raised in the most pristine, grass-fed New Zealand land where they're outdoors and they have the best everything, um, does, how does that impact the environment? If someone's buying super organic, grass-fed, organic pork and chicken, what's the environmental impact? That is a very controversial question. And a super organic and grass-fed doesn't necessarily tell us everything we might need to know about the environmental impact because rainforest beef could be organic and grass-fed and destroying the planet. But I also um, know farmers who are using uh, livestock in an integrated way as a part of their organic farms, and the manure is a critical part of the health of the soil, the way that they're replenishing it. Now, you can do a veganic agriculture, uh, and we could investigate that more. But currently, most of our organic farms are using manure in a significant way. So I think that the reality of it is that um, that uh, I, I, in my vision of an ideal world, just like there were buffalo here hundreds of years ago, I think that livestock in some form play a part in a wholesome, balanced ecosystem, but there are a lot less of them than we have now. As was quoted in that article, 86% of the mammals on the land of the world now are humans and livestock combined. So we are just taking over, right? And we need a lot more wild creatures and wild spaces and wild things to truly be sustainable and in right relation with the planet around us. So, um, but I, I know some people who feel that they do better with a certain amount of pasture-raised animal products in their diet. That's not me, but I respect everyone. I think that uh, everyone's own right to discover what works for them. The average American gets 34% of their calories from animal products. The blue zones where people live the longest, healthiest lives are zero to 10%. So um, I'm more interested in getting from 34 down to 10 or less than I am in whether zero or one or two or five or 10 is optimal. And I'm much more interested in getting rid of the factory farming system than I am in determining whether pasture raised has any place anywhere. And for the moment, I allow people to create what works for them in my mind and my vision of the world I wanna create and also recognize that there are some really clear directions we need to move radically and fast. Okay. Um, the uh, EPA um, has basically said that 95 to about 97% of the pesticides and herbicides are found in animal tissue as it's higher on the food chain. That's a pretty important thing. And I'm talking about organically grown as well. It doesn't really matter because there's so much pollution going on. If you, if you, for a child, for example, if you go organic, doesn't mean they're gonna be free from it. They're just gonna have one quarter to one sixth amount of pesticides in their blood as if you're eating junk inorganic food. You're not free from it. Same thing with organic food. What they found is you had one-fourth the amount of pesticides. You're not free from it, even with organically grown food. I'm talking about vegetables, but you're lower on the food chain. So it isn't exactly a perfect world. So I think it's important that, mm -hmm. that we understand that, because perfectionism really can be really hard on the mind. So it's never going to be quite perfect. Eating lower on the food chain is important. Now, I'll give you an example of why that's important. Right now, the sperm count around the world is, viable sperm count is at about 50%. It just has to drop a little bit more before we move into infertility. You kind of hinted at it before about how, how do we get people to be fertile. Well, get away from the GMO. But I'm saying the sperm count, and that has to do with pest, really, a lot has to do with pesticides, herbicides, and so forth. So it may be that the vegans are going to repopulate the world because they're eating low in the food chain. <laughs> just, just think about that, okay? We have to have a sense of humor about it, or we get a little depressed, okay? So, but think about this huge evidence of that, and, and, and fertility rates for women have dramatically gone down when you look at the statistics. 
they've dramatically decreased. So fertility is going down. Well, if everybody becomes infertile, that's it for human existence. So we have to kind of look at it in a, in a big way. So eating higher in the food chain is going to expose you to 95 to 96% of it. Breastfed milk, okay. Women who are just, just vegetarian, okay, have 1% of the pesticides and herbicides in their breast milk as meat-eating women. That's huge because of lots of reasons, neurological development of the baby and so forth. So really the concept to make it easy, eat lower on the food chain. Protect yourself. Protect for men, protect your sperm. No small deal. And for women, protect your ability to have children. No small deal. So we are really talking, when we're actually talking about this, is, is the existence of humanity and protecting humanity by eating lower in the food chain. So that's another framework of how to look at this. It's like, oh, hey, if we're infertile, we have a problem. Okay, so I'm going to throw that in as a consideration for the evolution of the species. Is we've got to eat lower in the food chain. This morning I, I gave the example of even three percent uh, when they did a Buddhist uh, study of, of vegans and uh, women who are eating meat, vegan uh, Buddhist monks who are eating meat once uh, like. 3% of their intake was meat, they had four times less diabetes. 3%, four times less, that's what we're talking about. And men who are about 8%, because that's what the uh, meat-eating men, Buddhist monks were eating, you know, they had half the amount of diabetes. Uh, I'm sorry, they had twice the amount of diabetes. So what we're talking about is a little bit makes a big difference on a lot of levels. So that's how I tend to look at it, broad strokes. If you have a question, don't eat it. Maimonides, the greatest physician of the 12th century. It's not that complicated. We need to make it less complicated in how we're looking at it. Okay. okay. I, I talk. I talk about some of the fertility issues in my lectures, and I at one point in my slideshow. I have a picture of rat testicles. And, and on the left are pink rat testicles. On the right are purple or bluish rat testicles. And I say, and the ones on the left were the control group that ate the regular soy, and the ones that had changed color ate the GMO soy. And I describe what happened, and then I say, I use this slide to take an opportunity for a long, slow drink of water and I'm, drink, I'm, I'm drinking the water slowly as, the, as all the guys are looking at these rat testicles. Um, it has an effect. It's good to know that the organs are affected. And I also want to mention that, I, since you mentioned infertility, I, in the film Secret Ingredients, the chiropractic clinic that had 92 infertile couples that have children, the number of couples that were infertile that did their protocol that didn't have children was zero, so a hundred percent. So I like being third because by the time it gets to me, you've already forgotten the question, <laughs> and I get to talk about whatever I want because that's my question. My answers may I have to be like, I'm a GMO guy. <laughs> but I, I will say this: since we were at one or a point non-GMO guy, non-GMO guy. Thank you, thank you. Um, we were talking about livestock, and and there's plenty of evidence that farmers. When they put animals on a non-GMO diet, they get better, and the, and, the, and the livestock producers make more money because they're spending less in medicines, less in antibiotics, and the pig, in the case of pigs, conception rates higher, and litter size can be higher, and they, we've seen severe stomach inflammations in pigs, et cetera. I mean, stomach, I mean just tremendous evidence uh, from actual farms that have made the switch. But, Whenever I interview a farmer who's made the switch, they always use this one very technical word, and I don't, they don't hear it from others. They just come, with, come up with it spontaneously themselves about what they've noticed in their pigs or cows. And they say to me, the animals are happier. 
and you can see it in their eyes. And sometimes the farmers start to tear up because they can see the change in their animal when they switch them to non-GMO feed. They can, sometimes the <clears throat> social animals of cows become individual and irritated and aggravated on a GMO compared to, anyway, I just thought I'd share that little one piece that very few people know about impacts on feed. Thank <laughs> you.